waiting for the grandson. He had granddaughters. Now it's time for a son. Yeah, I'm not sure I have any control over that. <laughs> Well, okay, well, good evening, everyone. It uh, is wonderful to see you all on. We have a few with us, and I'm sure we'll have a few more joining. We, uh, as mentioned before, this will be our final session, at least uh, at very minimum, uh, for for some time, and and realistically, uh, looking at the schedule, probably through the end of the year. Uh, but we'll see how things go, and and how the Lord wills. And uh, I know that Dr. John Matthew and Dr. Alexander Kudian are ready to keep going, but uh, <laughs> because of probably my travel schedule, um, they they may be uh, somewhat slowed down. So I'll try to, uh, to get them uh, back together again. So we'll go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then I'll just say a few words uh, following and then I'll open it up for anybody that uh, has any other comment, whether it's Dr. John Matthew, Dr. Alexander Goodian, um, or anyone else on at the moment. And then uh, we'll go into our topic and go from there. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Let's see, Frank, would you mind opening up with a word of prayer for us? All right. Our Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, again, as we come to study thy word and to look into the things that are important to us in this present day, that we might remain faithful to the doctrines of thy word in this New Testament era as we await the return of our Lord Jesus. We pray for our brethren as they open the scriptures and speak uh, forth the word of, of life and also a warning to those who would depart from the truth. May we be faithful to the Lord Jesus in his finished work and exalt and glorify him and glorify our heavenly father so we pray thy blessing upon our time together that thy glory may be seen and our lord jesus christ exalted for we pray in our savior's name amen 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 thank you brother so as mentioned i just want to say a few words of thanks uh to our brothers that uh, have spent so much time and effort in preparation, uh, Dr. John Matthew and Dr. Alexander Kudian. Uh, when we were discussing this, it seems uh, maybe almost upwards of a year and a half ago about how we could possibly uh, accomplish something such as this, where there was an opportunity for discussion and uh, questions, answers, and just how to, to make this work and, and what would be viable and so on. Um, you know, we had prayerfully considered different options and um, and we weren't even sure if it would last very long. And uh, we thought, uh, you know, we'd cover a few topics and maybe that would be the end of it. But praise the Lord. Uh, there is this is now the 57th video and there have been many topics that have been covered. Uh, some have uh, have been covered in great depth and some were really just kind of glanced glanced at as uh, we, we were moving to different topics and so on. But we do know that uh, it has been a time of edification, uh, a time of comfort, and I know in some cases even exhortation, as we have been considering uh, some very difficult and complicated topics, such as the one we're going to cover today, uh, the topic of LGBTQ. And uh, so I just want to say, you know, uh, grateful to our dear brothers for their effort, their time. This wasn't something that uh, they just turned on the computer and, and uh, started talking, although both of them uh, could very well do that. They spent time in study, and it is much appreciated by myself and I'm sure by you all as well. So uh, if Dr. John Matthew or Dr. Alexander Kudian, if either one of you have something you would like to say uh, before we continue into the topic, uh, please feel free to do so now. Again, this is going to be an extended session, yeah. and we understand if you do have to drop off. So um, go ahead, brother. Uh, thank you very much. I thank the Lord for this opportunity. So when I started, uh, I was not sure to continue this, and I could not say no to you, to Raymond. And then I agreed to do a few sessions. Then after that, you know, I had to pray, and then the Lord led me 
uh, to continue this and especially have been very comfortable with uh, my partner dr alexander kurin also uh, then uh, god uh, gave me uh, an understanding that you know i have been studying scripture the last 60 years you know if you don't utilize now when are you going to do it you know so i didn't want to displease the lord you know so i thought uh, i would do it you know i didn't want to do after my brain surgery 4 years ago about this time i have been in the hospital 4 years ago i didn't want to do anything and still i have not done any other except this one any public uh, speaking so i thank the lord and i especially uh, uh, you know due to corona you had to come back to from africa but lord you used to, you this uh, this uh, videos uh, 58 videos uh, many people call me from india and other places i have been blessed by watching this videos and god uh, uh, you, uh, you uh, used uh, you also in an amazing way so i wanted to thank all the participants uh, made it uh, lively and possible um uh, sam abraham born in anthony um uh, matthew carvacal uh, sister lc baby is a, is a global uh you know a teacher of our sisters you know and uh, she very active and blessen kurula from atlanta although is uh, early 20s a very uh, intellectual acumen and uh, asking pertinent questions and uh, ralph kachofer and then uh, sister sara mathi and uh, kachofer david you know email questions then i would like to thank uh, frank martin never missed one and uh, paul and uh, our mike romero and um, and many others you know especially uh, i want to thank uh, uh, george and lisi matakal you know they encourage many other people to sign on this program and it has been and all of you really encouraged us and uh, i have no time to mention everybody's name and uh, i'll pray for everyone and thank you uh, thank you uh, all of you appreciate very much uh, it has been uh, a very uh, encouraging time for me in the word uh, restudying it and reviewing what i have studied earlier and to go through doctrinal theological cultural and contemporary issues and to search the scriptures to see how what should be our attitude uh, to some of the things that are happening around us so these discussions were very contemporary very relevant very biblical very doctrinal and in accordance with our faith and it was also i believe very practical and helpful to us uh, as all of us know our knowledge is very much limited uh, so in all our discussions and uh, question answers probably we were not able to cover uh, all grounds uh, to answer all questions to the satisfaction of everyone but that should not discourage us this is an avenue this uh, forum has opened an avenue for us to continue to study what we have been discussing uh, all these weeks uh, more than uh, an year and i believe it is in the providential plan purpose and sovereign will of god for our blessing and above all for his glory to the praise of his glory um because the doxological purpose is the most important thing in the scripture everything is for his glory and uh, special thanks to raymond johnson for facilitating this uh, from for the technical side and coordinating and arranging and uh, doing many things uh, behind the scenes to make it possible and many of you friends brothers and sisters in the lord you were you were a very studious group you know and a very committed group and very enthusiastic and very zealous group and that really uh, helped uh, us to put our heart mind and soul into it and uh, dr john matthew has been uh, a a good pair with me to handle these issues so we could uh, together in a spirit of unity and harmony without contradictions you know even when we have differences to to share that gracefully that also worked out well i should also you know especially i would like to thank uh, colonial hills bible chapel i know there are many others who participated but more people as i understand is kind of colonial hills uh, 
probably our host for this program or you know took more effort and i consider that as a part of your vision uh, for the propagation of god's uh, holy word and i'm sure that will be uh, credited to your account uh, and the lord will uh, definitely bless you and reward you for uh, your vision and the commitment you have taken to see that this ministry is encouraged and blessed and it moves on. So thank you. God bless us in the days to come too. Thank you. Thank you, brother. You know, um, I want to comment on one thing that you said. Uh, you mentioned that in speaking of yourself and Dr. John Matthew, that um, your understanding is limited. And, you know, I don't know what that means for the rest of us, brother. If uh, your understanding and Dr. John Matthews understanding is limited, well, then what does that make us? But uh, that's for another show. We won't, we won't go into that right now. Uh, so if anybody else has anything they, they would like to say, uh, they can. Otherwise, we will move right into the topic and, and there'll be plenty of time. But uh, I'll leave this uh, this time open if somebody has something they would like to say. I would like to thank uh, all three of you, Brother Raymond, uh, especially you had a very busy schedule with all, with all the things going on with the ministry and you put together some time to uh, schedule these sessions, uh, prepare for these sessions and also organize this. So um, really good, uh, good uh, effort put in this and we can see that, uh, you know, you did not miss any uh, anything uh, made sure that everything runs smoothly that you know there that we have the videos that we can refer to um so all the uh, the back uh, the background things that needs to be taken care of uh, was done very well even with your busy schedule so really appreciate that uh, and um, also leveraging uh, the time and resources during the covid um, time you know that's something that uh, nobody has thought about that you know you uh, spent, uh, uh, you know, um, you brought up this idea of, you know, putting to, uh, making good use of uh, brother um, um, uh, Alexander Korean and brother uh, John Matthew with uh, their vast uh, ex knowledge and research that they have done over the years uh, and leveraging all that vast knowledge um, and also um, thanking them for, uh, you know, uh, walking us through these uh, different uh, areas uh, you know that uh, that we uh, over these past 56 58 sessions that we went through uh, you know there were a lot of topics i'm sure that you know even um, most of which though even i have you know was part of most of us were part of these sessions uh, we have to refer to back to them and you know watch to, twice or thrice to you know really understand what what was or what were all the things that were discussed in that so uh, yes uh, and thanks to um, brother john matthew and brother alexandra korean for uh, painstakingly you know preparing for this yes um, they have uh, the knowledge and uh, you know experience in those uh, they have studied through these uh, but even then it's it's a lot of information so um, i'm sure that uh, they have uh, put together these knowledge and uh, you know, to share in this in a, in a capsule format, a lot of information is uh, is a really uh, you know great job. So thanks for putting this together, and and also we have some something to refer to in future. And I'm sure the you know in, even in future, this uh, there will be a lot of people who will be referring to those videos, and it will be a blessing. Thank you. Matthew, I would like to take a moment to express my appreciation to both uh, Dr. John Matthew and Dr. Alexander Korean for taking the time and also uh, being so dedicated to uh, uh, share the doctrines and the um, answering questions. And also a special uh, thanks and appreciation to Raymond Johnson for um, his ability to um, uh, summarize after each presentation, he has the uncanny ability to uh, recapitulate and give a summary of what was said. 
that is very beneficial and I really appreciate that. Thank you all. Well, praise the Lord. Um, I'm glad that that uh, many have found this profitable. And, um, you know, as it was mentioned already, we certainly wanted to find a profitable way to use the time <coughs> that the Lord has given us during this um, pandemic. As uh, I know, uh, to have Alexander in Dallas or, you know, at his home for this long must be extremely unusual. Uh, he is often traveling uh, at, at least three quarters of the year. I'm sure he is gone. And um, and then, of course, uh, without being able to go to to Africa uh, because of the pandemic. So it, it gave us an opportunity then to to look into something different and praise the Lord that uh, that it was a profitable uh, time for for each of us. And I know that uh, I myself, again, was edified uh, through these meetings. So let's go ahead and move right into it. And again, we'll have an extended session. So feel free uh, to ask questions, uh, certainly about the topic. But if we want to ask questions about other topics, then let's do that. Uh, this is the time. And uh, we, we planned for an extended session. So uh, please utilize this time effectively for whatever it is you may have a question about. But before we get to the questions, let's move into our topic. And this is again concerning LGBTQ, a very relevant uh, topic to us today as it is essentially uh, encroaching uh, on the church or uh, Christendom. And so many we, we see are, are really bowing to uh, this, false and, this false narrative and false teaching and false doctrine. And so many are cowering to, uh, to the pressures socially. Uh, so we talked a little bit about that last week and some of the applications, and we're going to do even more of that this week. So we'll start again with Dr. John Matthew. So brother, can you go ahead and continue your conversation then uh, about LGBTQ? How do we handle it? Uh, what do we do moving forward? Yeah, thank you very much. By the way, I forgot uh, two things, you know, mentioned, you know, um, Brother Chirian Paul has been a, a constant help for me every time to uh, to do my program. Technically, he has been, uh, all, always I call him whenever I have problems, so I forgot to thank him. And the second point is, whenever they call me from Middle East and India, they say that uh, when uh, Dr. Alexander and myself, after we speak and your summary, really give them a good understanding about the subject. I forgot to mention that also, just wanted to I remind that also. And uh, continuing the same subject, LGBTQ2, uh, you know, so last week, uh, Dr. Alessandro gave the full, you know, today also, I hope, you know, he will do that. I'm not going to do it purposely. And it is coming in our church, you know, and uh, in our society everywhere. So I'm going to continue from last week, uh, androgyny. So that's the subject I'm going to speak today. The word itself combines with the uh, two concepts of means that uh, someone has a both masculine and a feminine uh, feminine characters andro is a latin prefix referring to maleness or men while gin gyn is a root that can be used as either a suffix or prefix meaning woman so a person who practices androgyny is an andro androgyne C-N-D-R-O-G-Y-N-E, a person who practice uh, androgyny is an androgyne. So individuals could have uh, both masculine and feminine qualities. People who mix male and um, female biology are referred to as intersex also. For Gnostic religion, the distinction between men and women should be rejected because it is a part of the useless creation order, according to them. The idea is androgyny, a synthesis of male and female. The Gospel of Thomas says, whom I'm quoting from Gospel of Thomas, they say, you know, it's like Jesus speaking. When you make the male and the female one and the same, so that the male not to be male or the female, then you will enter the kingdom. So quoted as Jesus said, uh, spoke uh, here in the, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, chapter 24, verse 22. So that's why 
when you depend and rely upon all the gnostic gospels and the parallel writings the ancient you know lost book of eden and everything uh, this all forgeries you know so what they do they take fragments from the bible and they create another book and another, another theology also another mythology also everything all the religions that's why saint augustine said you know so all the religions pagan religions uh, are uh, originated from demonic forces uh, so if you for example the f story about the flood noah's flood you know the moses lib about um, i i believe you know I, if my memory is right about 1400 bc and then hindu epics the mahabharata and ramayana uh, you know so were written in uh, bc 300 or 400 uh, 400 or 300 and the uh, ramayana mahabharata 18 puranas written in the 80s so all these stories have a uh, uh, the story of the flood 270 cultures have the story of the flood uh, so where did they get it from noah's flood you know the descendants you know they got the oral stories and they made other mythology like in hindu religion you know the shiva the uh, destroyer when he opened the third eye in the world will be destroyed in a flood so all these uh, writings uh, jewish uh, uh, rabbis and many writings you know they took some sections from the bible and they created other other books so one of the most uh, substantial uh, challenges uh, to early christians christianity was the movement of uh, gnosticism whose uh, amorphous and uh, syncretic nature was very appealing to people it gained strength in the second century professor nt right last week i quoted professor uh, nt right at oxford explained the difference the biblical gospels affirm jesus as the continuation and the climax of god's redemptive history with israel they recount how the long history of uh, god's work through israel came to its climax with the person of jesus contrarily the gnostic gospels completely uh, detached jesus from israel and the history of israel uh, with the god the god of the old testament as described by the gnostic gospels categorize him as evil and uh, judaism as uh, totally lost the gnostic gospel show no connection between jesus and the nation of israel and the acts of god in the old testament these reasons may be the biggest reasons why the gnostic gospels are not in the bible the gospels of the bible were written in the first century ad between 70 and 90 in the on the other hand gnostic gospels were written in the second uh, century ad the quotation of a uh, 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 professor right end here so the transgender movement claims that gender uh, identity doesn't necessarily align with the birth sex a person can uh, look within to write their own script whether that is that uh, that uh, is male female or some other gender regardless of the body so hindu god shiva has a an androgynous figure he is called artha nari shura so it uh, consists of half male a form of shiva and the half female form of his consort parvati so many rabbinical israel jewish writers also they think that adam also was androgynous and they say some say that even god was god is also androgynous and they say uh, um, adam was a hermaphrodite so androgynous adam and uh, just like a shiva you know so he is called arthanari half male and half uh, female so they say that a jewish rabbi is based on genesis chapter 127 they say that you know adam was consisted of male and female so contradiction in gender theory gender theory holds that gender is independent of biological sex it then expects that biological sex may be uh, altered to fit the patient's subjective sense of gender that's very important so they want the people to be free to legally change identity without the intrusion of the medical diagnosis that means most of the people 90 90 90% you know they just wanted to they think that one fine morning i am a woman in the man's body or vice versa 
so they don't need any medical uh, certificate or anything they insist that the gender is fluid undergoing plastic alterations once body means there is no going back the idea that uh, the idea of gender fluidity is a direct uh, contradiction of a transgender theory which involves a change of identity from one binary category to another so what happened is that uh, uh, last month i saw a person coming on tucker carson show he he thought that you know he, he although he is a male you know he is inside a woman he went to see a doctor you know so uh, gave the female hormone treatment for four months and after surgery scheduled after four months removed all the genitals and uh, uh, became a female so then he found out that he made a mistake and then uh, uh, coming back and uh, he came and pleaded everyone please you know don't do this you know because there is no changing back if you do the surgery there is no coming back there was a cbs in uh, this year may a leslie's uh, store she had an interview with all these people underwent their surgery and everything a lady you know he said went to doctor you know so said you know i feel i'm a man you know so she the doctor without giving any uh, psychological counseling gave a testosterone injections and everything after four months breast were removed and everything and then she feel now you know she she th now she thinks you know she's a female so many people's uh, lives have been ruined by this but uh, somehow you know gender is flu fluid you know that's against a transgender that means you know this this week you know if somebody feel that i'm a male the week after say i'm female then week after that they can change back to uh, the, that's the gender fluid you know that's more acceptable in May of uh, 2016, President Obama uh, administered, uh, administration issued a guideline to schools across the nation under Title IX uh, federal law banning sex discrimination against uh, transgender students. So what happened, this law actually created a mess in uh, uh, schools' bathrooms. So what happened was the boys, you know, they, some boys felt that, you know, they are, you know, girls, you know, they went to girls' bathroom. And then you might have read, you know, many, many girls were attacked and molested in the bathrooms and all, it happened all over the nation, you know, public bathrooms, you know, the, you don't need any medical certificate, you know, one day, fine morning, this, the boys think that I'm a female and go to female bathroom. So, uh, so this allowed transgender students to use the bathrooms that, um, aligned with their own subjective sexual orientation. So in my observation, I'm a political observer, you know, it's uh, not from any book, you know, I have, a, you know, a, a formulated a theory, you know, in the last 100 years, uh, three percent of America has made an impact throughout this universe. One is uh, on May 25th, 1960, President Kennedy announced before a joint session of Congress a traumatic and uh, ambitious goal of sending an American uh, safely to the moon before the end of the decade. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and the landed, actually the man landed in the moon 1969, July 16th. So that's made a scientific revolution, you know, first time, you know, scientific revolution in the world, you know, changed the world. So after that 1980, when President Reagan came, you know, he, after four months, he ordered, you know, CIA and others, FBI to destroy the Soviet Union. Eight years, he, he systematically, there are many books available if you want to read, you know, how he destroyed the Soviet Union. That was a political change throughout this universe. But, uh, you know, he called the Soviet Union an evil umpire. Now, Obama will be known, if you look back to 100 years, after 100 years, when you look back, all these things happened when at the time of uh, President Obama, LGBTQ uh, and uh, woke and uh, CRT and over things. So I think, you know, just like, um, uh, you know, the impact of President Kennedy uh, sent a man to the moon, you know, same impact is, you know, President Obama is sending boys to the girl's bathroom have the same impact, you know. So I'm not, uh, you know, saying to ridicule or anything like that, you know, I, I to understand, you know, the thing about after a few years, when you look back, the history, you know, the cultural change, shift, paradigm shift in the universe. In America, that is happening in, in front of our eyes, you know, so we are seeing that. 
So for, that's for the historians too. This is my, my political observation, not from any books or any, anything. That's my political observation. So next, what is intersectionality? During 1970s, black activists, a number of whom were L LGBTQ, developed a theoretical framework to serve as a model to other women of color. Uh, to broaden uh, feminism's definition, uh, definition and scope. This term is uh, popularized by a uh, law professor, Kimberly uh, Crenshaw. In her 1991 article, Mapping Margins, she explained how people who are both women and uh, people uh, with the color are marginali marginalized. Intersectionality promotes tribalism and uh, solipsism. S O L I P S I S M. Solipsism means extreme egocentrism. That's the meaning. It tells you how oppressed you are. It tells you what you are allowed to say and think. Intersectionality is a conspiracy theory of a victimization. This term was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender intersect with one another and overlap overlap. Ben Shapiro gave the following definition. I would uh, define intersectionality at least the way that I have seen it manifest on college campuses and a lot of the political left as a hierarchy of victimhood in which people are considered members of a victim class by virtue of membership in a particular group. And at the intersection of various groups, lies the ascent of the hierarchy. If you are a woman, then you are, you are more victimized, victimized than a man. Or if you are a black, then you are more victimized than, uh, than if you are a white. So critical race theology, CRT, you know, so we discussed that one time, and just briefly I would explain that also, is fast becoming America's new institutional orthodoxy. The Marxist theory primarily focuses on the conflict between poor and rich. However, it becomes irre irrelevant to America. Then they changed the tactics and adapted their revolutionary theory to the social and racial unrest. Critical race theology is uh, formulated in the 1990s and built on the intellectual framework, identity-based um, uh, based on Marxism, based on Marxism, it has become a default ideology in our public life. It has been injected into government agencies, public school systems, teacher training programs and corporations in the form of diversity training. It deploys a series of euphemism to describe uh, critical race theology, including equity, social justice, diversity, culturally responsive teaching, etc. They are the masters of language construction, realizing that neo-Marxism would be a hard sell. Equity, on the other hand, sounds non-threatening and is easily confused with the American principle of equality. Christopher F. Rufo was a former federal employee. By the way, he had a good article in today's Wall Street Journal, Christopher Rufo. He writes, uh, the FBI was holding, uh, I'm quoting, FBI uh, was holding a workshop on the intersectionality theory. The Department of Homeland Security was telling white employees that they were committing micro inequalities uh, and had been uh, socialized into oppressor roles. The Treasury Department had a training session telling staff members that virtually all white people uh, contribute to racism and that they must convert everyone in the federal government to the ideology of anti-racism. In Springfield, Missouri, a middle school uh, forced the teachers to locate themselves on an oppression matrix based on the idea that straight, white, English-speaking Christian males are members of the oppressor class and must atone for their privilege and convert from white supremacy. So the next one is woke, W-O-K-E, woke. The woke, let me tell you, woke is coming to your church. It is already in the corporations, you know, so everywhere, you know, so was officially added in the, into dictionary in 2017. And it means to be 
uh, awake to sensitive social issues such as racism. The claims break into mainstream language came from the Black Lives Matter movement. Work, which has a long history in Black culture, was propelled into mainstream in 2014 by activists protesting after the killing of Michael Brown, a Black teenager, by a white police <coughs> officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Last week, I explained the in answer to a question. Work is now defined as to be cognizant of racial and social injustice. The work ideology is based on a set of quasi-Marxist theories that divide society into oppressors and the oppressed, based on characteristics such as race, sex, class, or sexual proclivities. Work and CRT are the same. By the way, I saw in a Wall Street Journal two days ago, and uh, as a, a writer, and he also appeared on TV also, Vivek Ramaswamy. He wrote a book, a book on WOK, Walking. So it's a pre-publication only next month. It will be, I already ordered $25, you know. So uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, he, he, his parents uh, was the Indian immigrants. Uh, so one thing I wanted to tell you that, you know, so the Indians, although it's a, uh, although there are thousands of languages and cultures and difference, one thing bind them together. Uh, you know, immigrants from India, the Indian Muslims, Indian Hindus, Indian Christians, Indian brother and Christian, you know, all 90% of them, they are ardent supporters of the Democratic Party. So Soviet Union brainwashed all the third world countries, you know, so they automatically in their DNA. So Vivek, Ram, this Ramaswamy, his parents also, they were highly educated and high positions. And Vivek Ramaswamy is 35 years old. He's a prodigy. In the sixth grade, you know, he attended the law school. And he's, he owns a biotechnology company. He's now over 35. So he will all say, you know, just like uh, he, but somehow he began to think, utilize his brain, although he's a prodigy. Now, now he knows that woke, you know, although he, he supported, you know, the other liberal policies, now he understands woke is coming in uh, trying to destroy America. It's a Marxist revolution. I advise everyone to uh, buy that book and read it because it is coming to your chapel and churches and schools and everywhere. And it's a, it's a Marxist revolution to destroy America. And then they say slavery, you know, slavery, let me tell you, slavery started 4,000 years ago in Middle East and it is still existing in the Middle East. The slaves who came to the American continent, only 5% came to the United States. So all the world, you know, everyone practiced slavery. And uh, so that's no reason because they're destroying America just because the forefathers, uh, uh, practice slavery. So this is our Marxist revolution. Just that's all I wanted to uh, explain about this. Uh, uh, back to you, Raymond. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, brother. I have a uh, quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, talking about gender fluid. Um, yeah. And I understand that this is certainly uh, of great implication uh, as we consider then you mentioned Adam and uh, God and uh, and how that relates to this but uh, i think we we answered that and i think uh, you explained that sufficiently but uh, you know maybe there there's a question for that later my question is a little bit different a little bit different so if you can be gender fluid then what is the answer to race fluid you know um, why can we not why can't i choose to be a different race if i feel as okay. if I am Indian, as an example. I know my skin's a little lighter than yours, brother, but I'm I'm learning Malayalam, and uh, <laughs> I can say a few words. So why can't I uh, then say that, uh, you know, race fluidity? I am I Indian. Think, yeah, I think that's a wonderful statement. I think we should start a, a movement, you know, so about that, you know, be, if a, if the media companies and corporations support it, definitely it would work. You know, what this is happening, you know, it's uh, propelling, you know, this is any any false narrative happening because of the corporations and media is supporting, you know. So uh, gen uh, gender fluid is a uh, diametrically transgender people don't like that because, you know, can change it, come back and go always, you know. So race fluid, you know, I think if we work together, you know, they have to admit that tomorrow I can declare that I'm you know, pure black and or pure white or something like that. They cannot say no. So that's a good observation. <laughs> I hope somebody will start a movement for that. 
Yeah, I don't think that's going to be us, brother. But, uh, <laughs> you know, perhaps uh, someone else. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, certainly what you mentioned is extremely important. It ties into a lot of our previous sessions uh, along. You know, you mentioned CRT, uh, you mentioned woke. Uh, we talked about Marxism and so on. And all of this so clearly goes together. Uh, and we understand that even LGBTQ, uh, you know, gender neutral, gender fluidity, uh, cisgender, all of these sort of uh, all of this conversation, uh, we have to understand that they're they all have the same um, creator, if we can say that, and Satan as he is trying to destroy uh, the culture. Uh, however, we should not be surprised. We know this is exactly uh, what will happen as the end approaches. So, um, Dr. Alexander, if you have anything you would like to say concerning Dr. John Matthews' topic, and then obviously uh, go right into yours, brother. Okay. Thank you. Last week also, I shared a little bit about the history uh, of the LGBTQ, and today Dr. John Matthew elaborated on the various subgroups and subsets and the various terms, terminologies, and the you know various movements associated under this broad umbrella. So uh, all of us have a fairly good understanding of it, but uh, I think our discussions in relation to the history of it last week and today uh, probably helped us to put that in the right perspective and to have a clear understanding of it. Uh, our burden is, as uh, last week, as Raymond reminded us, you know, the reason we are discussing these things are not just uh, to learn the history of it, uh, that is foundational, we must know about it, but what should be our attitude and our action plans and as churches, as Christians, as believers, uh, what should be our approach to uh, the LGBTQ movement and uh, what are some of the ministries in which we can be involved in? What are some of the guidelines? So that will be my focus. Uh, we already discussed some of it last week also. But in conclusion, just uh, you know, a few more things which uh, I thought during this week. Uh, uh, before that, there is uh, something which we must always be aware of. That is, the danger of this movement is, you know, this is a uh, an aberrant, sexual, deviant, perverted behavior. You know, so there are different kinds of sin, adultery. You know, and one sexual sin, fornication, another one, yeah, and uh, rape, another one. So this is also like uh, pedophilia, another one, pornographic involvement, another one. So this is also a also one of the uh, sexually deviant, perverted behavior. You know, that's what it is, and uh, nothing more. But the problem is why this has become a big problem. The problem is. Some of these groups, LGBTQ and uh, their subsets and various groups, they want special privileges. That is how I would see it. That is why this has become a problem. You know, uh, the whole world is under sin in various kinds of sin, various types of sin, uh, big and small. Some sins have more consequences. Some sins do not have uh, that uh, uh, impact or consequence. Some are public, some are private, some are hidden, some are in the light. So, you know, various kinds of sin. That is not the issue here. The issue is why it has torpedoed our society, why it has disturbed our society, why it has created a chaotic condition in our government, in our society, in our schools, in our workplace. The reason, as I see it, it is not because of just homosexual behavior, you know, uh, because that's a sinful behavior, uh, nothing more than that. But the problem has erupted because these people, this, these groups, they need special privileges, special rights, and wanted government to create laws and legislation to protect them and to fulfill all their demand. That is how 
in my mind, this has created havoc and it has become a big problem. If somebody is a homosexual, why that is a big problem to me? You know, it's not at all. Why it is a problem to you? It is not at all. But now we are all talking about it and sensible people, believers, Christians, and even, you know, known Christians who have some sense of morality, they all are panicking and are disturbed about this because these groups are demanding special privileges for them, special rights, uh, and uh, uh, want the government to make laws to protect them. And, uh, you know, and demand many things for their advantage, which uh, other segments of society do not have. So it is not even equal rights, even more special rights, special privileges, and make laws to protect us. So that is how this has become more of a problem in our country and in the society. Now, by the very same token, like, what would happen if child molesters and rapists would say, we want special protection, you know, we want to get preference and nobody should arrest us, do anything against us. We have our own rights because that is also another perverted sexual orientation. So why if all these, if, you know, think about for a moment, if all these groups, like including uh, the child molesters and rapists and uh, all others, you know, like that, if they all want to have their own rights, their own protection and uh, their own safety and, uh, you know, that they should not be arrested, they should not be criminalized and they should be protected, they should have all the privileges. What will happen to our society? That is a total disintegration. So. I see it all together, you know, there is no logic in this. When one group says we want protection and rights, what if all the other groups, you know, including some of the groups which I already mentioned, then society cannot function like that. So you can, you know, like a, a people with common sense can think how ridiculous, you know, these arguments are, and this is taking us nowhere. Now, Another thing which I thought about it is the rainbow. Because rainbow is significant in the Bible. And uh, here I find a Satan's demonic, satanic, deceptive scheme. Very evident. We should not miss that. You know, they could have taken any, any other symbol or sign. But. Satan wanted them to take a biblical symbol because rainbow is God's sacred, global, universal promise from God that he will not destroy the earth by flood. So that sacred symbol, that global, universal promise and covenant from God, Satan has taken and perverted it and uh, made it a ploy to mock the scriptures and a scriptural symbol. That's how I see it. Otherwise, what is what does this movement has to do with rainbow? You know, there are millions and billions of symbols you can find in, in different uh, uh, books or cultures, civilizations and philosophies and in science and in religions. Why this is from the Bible? To really know that, to re it really tells us that this is very, very satanically organized and orchestrated rebellion. So that also we should not miss. So uh, last week we didn't touch on that. So I thought of mentioning that. Now, coming back to our responsibility, our, you know, our, our burden. Uh, we are called to be people of love and people of uh, compassion, people of sympathy to anyone, to a hurting world, people living in sin, you know, whatever be their sin, including <coughs> homosexuals and people like that. So we must be willing to minister to them 
when the Lord opens up a door for us to minister to them. So we must have that willingness. But when we are willing to do that, we must always remember that they are also redeemable. And this is not an unpardonable sin. You know, this is not an unpardonable sin. This is not the sin unto death as kind of, you know, it can be the sin unto death. But this is a pardonable sin. This is a redeemable sin. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. So that is our motivation. That is our, our foundation. And the wonderful truth that there is deliverance from any kind of sin through the power of the gospel and through the work of the Holy Spirit, any kind of abnormalities, any kind of addictions, including, you know, sexual, perverted sexual behavior. So th that should be our attitude. I know all of us know this, but we should feed our mind with that thought so that in spite of the intensity and the gravity of their sin, uh, we should also have this attitude and our willingness to minister to such people in love, in compassion, in tolerance, and, uh, uh, and in grace. But that grace must be coupled with the truth, grace and truth. You know, how that can be coupled with truth? We must always uphold God's ideal for human sexuality and sexual relationship. That is how we do this in grace and in truth. The first part I was elaborating was on grace. The second part is, you know, we, we, we cannot glamorize this, if I can use that word. The whole world is glamorizing. Media is glamorizing it, you know. Uh, our government is glamorizing, our society is glamorizing, entertainment industry is glamorizing. We cannot glamorize it. We are opposed to it. We hate it. We don't like it. We don't love it. And we know it is against the word of God, against God's ideal. So there we do not make any compromise. We must always support God's ideal for human sexuality and sexual relationship standing on biblical authority and without glamorizing uh, this thing, uh, sin. Number two, you know, the church must make use of every opportunity to remain in contact with people who will be willing to listen to the gospel and who will be willing to have a discussion or a dialogue or willing to listen to what the word of God has to say and to uh, receive the message of the gospel. And again, I want to, you know, emphasize that everyone is redeemable. So we must see them also as a mission field, you know, and uh, the Lord can deliver them. So we have a positive message, a message of love and grace and forgiveness. The Lord can forgive, the Lord can deliver, the Lord can break this shackle, and the Lord can transform. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all, 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 all things are uh, passed away. Now, if we have an opportunity to talk to such people, you know, we must uh, definitely show them that this is something not pleasing to God. This comes under sin. And we must also show them that there are so many other sins and this is not the only sin and there is deliverance for all sins. So our approach should be, you know, on a, on a positive note uh, without compromise. The best, uh, the most encouraging verse, you know, I have found in the scripture is in 1 Corinthians in relation to the ministry among them is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So even in the city of Corinth, this was, you know, the, in that society, this uh, homosexuality and all those things were a big problem. And many of the Corinthian believers were ex-homosexuals. Have you ever thought about that? Let me read this passage to you. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at the next verse. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Yes. But the golden verse comes after that. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God. That yes. will be my verse for that. You know. And that is. I could not find a better <clears throat> verse, a better passage than this, you know, which, uh, which talks about sin, which talks about the things which God hates, but at the same time, the power of redemption and Paul brings in his heavyweight soteriological terms here, you know, you were washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So, brothers and sisters, you know, even though we are not experts in various areas of ministry to such people, our mind should be clear and we should have some idea so that we can pray for such people. And when there is an opportunity, we can take into consideration all these truths and standing on biblical grounds that we can minister to them. Uh, another, you know, uh, passage that comes to mind is uh, Jude, the epistle of Jude, uh, the last verses, even though this is talking about people who have been deceived by the apostate teachers, the principle is uh, relevant to any situation of ministry. Verse 17, epistle of Jude. This is an exhortation to believers in this verse. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is our foundation. You remember the word, our biblical foundation, our authority. What does the Bible teach about sexuality, human relationship? You know, what is the point of our uh, reference? Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means you don't have to worry about what the modern apostles are saying, you know. So you don't have to listen to them. You, you know, they, they are out. Listen, remember the words which were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's very specific. No other apostle. Only the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so that is remember. Now, Verse 20. So first we have, should have a biblical foundation in our ministry, in any ministry to everyone in, in the ministry of missions and evangelism. Verse 20. You, beloved, building yourselves upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. That is, you remain faithful to your life, discipleship and commitment. You know? I'm using an R, R outline. So remember, and building yourselves upon your most holy faith, you remain faithful, solid in your conviction, in your faith. Then look at verse from 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And the next verse, 22. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear. Rescue the perishing. Save them with fear. Or reach out. Rescue the perishing. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Probably that means that when you get into this kind of sensitive areas of ministry, you know, Make sure that you are not polluted and contaminated by their sins. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. You know, uh, so uh, remember that is our foundation. Remain faithful.
to our convictions, build up strong spiritual muscles, and then rescue and reach out to others. But in certain areas of ministry, we need to make sure that when we mingle with such people, we, when we are in such mission field, that we should not be contaminated by the defilement and the pollution of those sins. So that is another guideline. Another guideline, the words all of us know, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. That's a powerful statement, you know. It is the, uh, the shortest version of the Great Commission. Great Commission is seen in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in Acts, and also in John, in different, uh, in def different editions. Matthew's is the longest. Uh, but in John is the shortest. And in John, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So Jesus Christ is the model and the pattern of our mission. Just as the Father has sent him into the world to a life of sacrifice, for condescension, for showing love and grace and redemptive grace to others. You know, follow that pattern in our mission and in our ministry. I know certain situations dealing with, you know, uh, people like this, it is not easy, it is challenging, and it is, you know, mind boggling, and it is uh, not at all easy. But we should be encouraged by the power of the gospel and the instructions in the word of God. We can also conduct in our assemblies, maybe as and when there is a need, occasional and periodic seminars to make people aware of these things, you know, and to educate people on our mission strategies, what the scripture says, like our discussion now periodically, th that is uh, one thing which we can do. We can fill our track to racks and our library, you know, uh, and in the assembly uh, halls where we have books and booklets and tracks, we can also include materials that can be helpful uh, for young people and others that should give them clear guidelines in relation to such ministries. So I hope and pray that the Lord may encourage us. It's a kind of, you know, kind of a disgusting topic to some extent because we know what is really happening. But at the same time, the Lord is calling our attention that the Lord came to this world to save sinners and to a fallen world. And these are the consequences of the fall. But there is redemption, there is deliverance, there is victory, and there is liberation from any and every sin. And that is possible. And uh, the church and we are the means and the agents through which the Lord will accomplish that purpose. So those thoughts will definitely give us a boost and uh, also encourage us even though our ministry and our involvement for many of us in such situation may be, may be minimal but maybe in our prayer life and in our sensitivity to such ministry opportunities and things like that you know this should not this should give us uh, a, a soothing this should be like a soothing balm uh, that should give us definitely encouragement. Thank you. Thank you, brother. You know, I really appreciate um, your thoughts there and really from start to finish, uh, really going over application and how do we put this to practice and a very practical approach, if I understood correctly, and that is that uh, we love the individual that um, you know, that, that we see them just as Christ sees them, and that is a sinner that um, is awaiting uh, salvation, so should they accept. But um, but we also, as you mentioned from Jude, need to understand that it is difficult, and there is fire in some cases mm -hmm. surrounding the individual. And we have to be careful in the situations that we put ourselves in and how we can approach them. And uh, certainly I appreciate that as that's something we need to remember 
that it is possible to hate the sin, but still love the individual and to share Christ with them, to see them as a brother or sister in Christ, as opposed to uh, one that will uh, be in the lake of fire. We must remember that, uh, you know, that everyone is going to continue to live. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be uh, in joy and, and jubilee or uh, in torment. And if we see the world around us through the eyes of Christ, then it will be our objective to try to witness to them. So, brother, I appreciate those those thoughts and comments. And certainly we need to remember that because so many Christians are said to be uh, filled with hate and uh, and bigotry and so on. And we know that this is not the case. In fact, we should be displaying love. We should be displaying Christ, uh, just as our brother exhorted us to do so. Uh, so I greatly appreciate those words of encouragement, uh, some words of comfort, but also exhortation. You didn't mention that, but it definitely was. Uh, so I appreciate that. Okay, so we still have uh, plenty of time, as mentioned. Uh, we are going to extend the session. I know some of you are uh, looking at your watches and thinking you may have to leave, and some uh, may have left already, and that's okay. We understand you have commitments. But if there are any questions concerning this topic, of LGBTQ or any other topics, please. Now is the time. I'd like to <clears throat> Matthew here. Um, actually, I would like to share an experience because a couple of years ago, when I visited an assembly in India, after the worship service, uh, one of the evangelists stood up and gave a testimony, saying that uh, he had an opportunity to um, share the gospel with a transgender and he or she or they, whoever that is, accepted the Lord and he wants to bring that person to the assembly. And all of a sudden it was, uh, uh, you know, two sides uh, who, you know, people who didn't want them to come or uh, who, who, who would love to have them. You know, that's, that is the, you know, I don't know exactly what happened afterwards. I left, and then um, I, you know, my question is, it's not a question. I actually a comment. I just wonder how many of us will have the grace and ability mm -hmm. to to uh, share the gospel with such a person, and then how many of assemblies will be open to receive them once they are uh, saved? Yes. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you for that point, brother. I, I just want to mention here that it's important for us to be self aware and to know who we are, uh, as our brother's mentioning here, uh, because when we can see this problem in ourselves, as our brother's pointing out, then we can address it. But we have to realize uh, where we stand on such an issue and that we obviously do want to have the grace. Uh, Dr. Alexander, were you about to say something, brother? Um, yes, you know, thank you, brother Matthew. Yeah, that's a very, very practical, very, very valid challenge before us because it is not easy for many, many churches, many assemblies, and many Christian groups to easily accommodate and welcome such people, even though they are genuinely saved. So, you know, uh, that's a, a real practical problem, uh, at least in, in some places. Uh, I know about such situations too. So we have to pray and we have to encourage people and we have to educate them so that they should have a different mindset, the mind of Christ, you know, and should be uh, willing to welcome such people and to minister to them. In Bangalore, you know, um, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, fellowship with uh, a young brother who was working among transgenders. So I got some exposure to that. So he uh, he knew that it will be very difficult for him to bring such people to you know the churches. So what he did was he would meet. You know, he was a member of one of our assemblies. He would meet. So he used to take counsel from me every now and then. He would meet with them. And uh, they will have their, you know, fellowship time and Bible study 
and uh, you know uh, small worship service like that and uh, i do not know what happened to that whether it is going on now or not so some evangelists or missionaries because of the some of the practical problems have uh, you know uh, adopted different uh, methods to tackle this issue but still are able to minister to them even though that may not be the ideal way of doing it yeah thank you brother so uh, addressing a very practical uh, need are there any other questions that, uh, that anybody may have again this topic or any other topic I had a question on uh, Ephesians 5 in verse 11 it says do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness but instead even expose them for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret so i guess my question is uh, <clears throat> if it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret i guess how much do we uh, talk about this uh, what is a line i guess basically uh, what is the line that we should draw here yeah yeah thank you uh, brother i uh, i think uh, you know definitely the uh, verse in jude the last verse also you know which we read about the fire and about how careful we should be also gives us that same warning you know that we have to be extremely careful that we should not make any compromise the name of the lord may not be honored and may not be disgraced in any way but at the same time you know we are also we have also have to look at other scriptures, you know, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. So the Lord Jesus Christ went to the despised and the sinners and uh, the rejected ones. And uh, we are called to be the salt and light of the world. But in this specific verse, like uh, uh, rather expose them. So our responsibility is not only to reject uh, sin, but also to teach them about that sin is something God hates and it brings separation from God. And uh, uh, so our our doctrine of sin, our tone or our attitude should not be harsh, but at the same time, our doctrine about Christian morality, about sin should be very clear that we should be able to expose them through the power of the word of God and the power of the spirit of God working through the word. So that, you know, in John's gospel, the Lord said the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin. Uh, we cannot convict them. You know, we can expose them, show them, but the conviction comes from the spirit of God. Yes, so this is an area where we have to like a kind of, you know, uh, 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 very, we have to be very uh, cautious and very careful uh, to maintain the balance. Thanks. You know, I was reminded uh, when you mentioned that, brother, uh, about John the Baptist and uh, in Luke 319, uh, you remember that he exposed the uh, mm -hmm. conduct and um you know of herod and what he was doing and uh of course he, he exposed it and we know what happened to him because of it um, yes but either way he exposed it um but what you know dr alexander was saying of course you can you can be right in what you say but wrong in how you deliver it yes. and uh, that's important that we understand that that we are doing it in love uh, with an attitude of, um, again, love and grace and, and hopefully redemption uh, with salvation in mind. Uh, so 
<clears throat> certainly a tricky subject. Any yeah, other questions? Question. Yep. Yes. Actually, I'd like to share an encounter that I had about, say, 25 years ago. Um, I was working with a patient who had full blown AIDS and, um, you know, being naive, I wanted to share the gospel with him and I asked him where he would go if the Lord would ask for his life tonight and he said I'll go to heaven. And then we, um, you know, talked about I talked about the lifestyle he chose. And I said, what well, the lifestyle you chose is really an abomination to God. Um, what makes you so sure that you'll go to heaven? He he knew all the right words to say to me, but no, but the, he did not believe what he was doing was wrong. And in, in fact, he said, "Sister, I was created like this. This is yes. not my. Thing. It is how uh, genetically I am. Yeah. God created me this way. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, this happened 25 years ago. It's still fresh in my mind because." I could not win him over. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's how you created that way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He said he was created that way. Yeah. And that's uh, like today's escape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, you know, that is one of the deceptive strategies Satan uses to convince them and to propagate that it is natural. But it's very important that when Paul dealing with this, this same topic in Romans 1, he uses the word unnatural, you know? So yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. See, how say, as I told you <clears throat> about the rainbow, how Satan's hand is very much in all this. So that is why they say, I was created like this. I was born like this. Mm -hmm. You know, genetically, I am like this. Naturally, I am like this. And uh, this is, uh, I cannot change it because it is Satan's lie. And only the power of the gospel and the blood of Christ, you know, is the only thing that can uh, deliver them. I have a question. <clears throat> How can you clarify First John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, especially 17? First John chapter 5, 16 and 17, especially verse 17. I'll go ahead and read those real quick for everyone. First John chapter 5, 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Especially verse 17, she's saying all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. That's a very important question also at the same time, you know. So there's clearly it's implied that there are certain sins uh, which uh, lead to death which uh, no human beings can say, you know, only God knows in his sovereign power, sovereign knowledge, omniscience. And uh, then when they cross the line, God is going to take them. But the problem is that as humans, uh, we are judgmental, you know, so then somebody dies early or, you know, we tend to say that, well, you know, he died because of the, this happened to him because of that and God this way also. I, I would never quote this words, you know, for in connection with anybody uh, because uh, we don't know because we all, although we are believers, we commit uh, different types of sins, you know, lying and uh, white lies and uh, uh, many other sins. So we don't know which one. So we have to be very careful, you know, so uh, although our salvation is safe, you know, God can uh, call you take you out from this word so that to discontinue that abomination. So that's up to God. So there, it is clear that, you know, there are some sins will lead to death, which we don't know which one we can identify. <laughs> that's my opinion. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, 
you know, there is in the light of John's uh, epistle, uh, because John mentions uh, about false teachers, there are some interpreters who believe that this is talking about the sin of unbelief and apostasy. You know, so a person who he has deliberately is rejecting Christ, is an apostate, and he does not want anything to do with the Lord. Uh, the the ap apostle is talking about such people. But that is not my personal understanding of this verse. My personal understanding is more in line with what Dr. John Matthew said, that there may be some repeated addictive sin or a high-handed sin about which the Lord may convict a person, convince him that it is wrong, a believer, and to forsake it. But still, if he persists in that, it can happen in a disciplinary action from the Lord resulting in physical death. So, uh, yes. you know, so that may be a better way to understand it because that goes well with uh, what we read in First Corinthians chapter 11 taking part in the Lord's Supper uh, in an unworthy manner. And because of this, many of you are sick and many of you sleep. Yes. You know, because of God's temporal disciplinary judgment, you know, came upon them. But again, we cannot make that judgment and we should not categorize uh, any sin in relation to that. But uh, what John is saying here that we should not ask that if we are convinced that a person is really continuing in that kind of deliberate high-handed sin, God's discipline will come up, the action will come upon him and uh, so that the Lord can, uh, you know, uh, deliver him from the uh, power of uh, such things, uh, sin. So, um, but there are sins not leading to death. That is talking about the other types of sin and about the mistakes and the sins that always happen in our life. And we always have to pray for one another and we have to encourage one another. We have to counsel one another. But there may be situations in which there may be high-handed, hard or rebellious sins, uh, which may bring God's judgment upon disciplinary judgment upon God's own children. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that, brothers. Appreciate that. Any other questions? We still have time. I have a question. Uh, so what is what is your opinion about uh, George Floyd? So recently, the officer, Derek Chauvin, was sentenced uh, to <laughs> imprisonment. So. Uh, does he does he uh, deserve that punishment or you know, what's your take on that? <laughs> Nathan, you know, that's a question. It's a household. Uh, everyone discuss that because I have uh, all these files on my desk, you know, because important events, actually. Uh, last Friday, Derek Chauvin was sentenced for 22 and a half years in jail. And uh, even the largest, one of the largest newspapers in India, Malala Manorama, that was headlined, you know, so all over the world, you know, George Floyd is a household name. So I am glad that uh, the police officer was sentenced to death, you know, sorry, sentenced for 22 years because, you know, he was a bad person. You know, that doesn't mean that all the police uh, in the United mm -hmm. States, 99 point are very good, you know, and uh, Bad policemen, bad people will be there until Jesus Christ establishes millennium. So, by the way, since you asked the question, uh, let me ask the audience. I will, uh, you can unmute and tell me. Uh, I will give a five, six seconds. How many of you have heard about uh, Tony Timba? If you heard about unmute and tell me. Yes, I, have, I know about uh, Tony Timba or I heard about Tony Timba. Please, uh, please unmute and uh, tell if you know. About five seconds. Yeah, I, I heard about him. He was the white guy who got. Uh, oh, okay. Th thank you. So you 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 are one of the few. So so what does it say that uh, Tony Timba? Oh, alternate media. That's why. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Tony Timba was was a white person. 
he was 32 years old and uh, he was a trucking company executive so he called 911 uh, because he was scared of his life he was having a psychotic episodes he said he was off his medication he forgot his medication so he he himself called 911 and five police officers came and it, this happened in Dallas 2000 white police officers came and and hand, handcuffed him and pushed him down and uh, put their legs on them and just like uh, they put on uh, George Floyd you know it was eight minutes and few seconds for George Floyd Tony Timba was 14 minutes and this guy begging for his life saying that you are killing me please please but you know this white police officers were you know taunting him mocking him yeah you know you because uh, he was passing out you know because uh, the, his their knee was on him you know so and then he was passing out you know the policeman saying yeah wake up need to go to school time time, uh, time, time to go to school you know so uh, he, they were taunting and then he died see <laughs> no one knows it so he was not a criminal or anything like that so what it shows you know the american media american culture has you know decreased so bad you know when so much evil to represent the liberal american black america george floyd unfortunate you know he shouldn't have uh, you know died you know the, the police at the same time when they when they have a icon you know uh, statues in every city in, in even london with the angels wings george floyd you know so you know biden said you know so the death of george floyd has more high better more higher impact than martin luther king mm -hmm. so think about the morality so what mm -hmm. martin luther king said you know i have a dream speech you know when i came to america you know early 70s so when i hear the martin luther king speech you know frequently it, it thrills my heart you know inspired me and he was speaking in 1963 delivered you know 250000 people on the steps of lincoln uh, memorial in washington uh, dc what was his speech i have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character i have a dream today so what is it a christian message you know you will be judged by the content of your character not by your mm -hmm. color uh, you know so what is happening now everything in india in america is by color who was george mm -hmm. floyd he didn't have to die but at the same time I, just like i said i have all these files about all these cases here let us see uh, you know george it's it's available all over you know it, it, it's a public file i'm not saying anything nothing new uh, so six burglaries three car theft multiple illegal uh, trespasses cocaine and alcohol addiction two violent home invasion three armed robberies dealing uh, 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 fentanyl and meth beating four victims senseless and being arrested 23 times since 1998 so and then you know he put a gun on the uh, pregnant woman's stomach also so many things and so it's unfortunate he died you know he should, but the police was bad that doesn't mean that you know george floyd is a hero if that the greatest hero for black america has or the liberal white people have this this is the hero so what is our moral character throughout the world so if you never heard about tony timba shame on the media and american corporations because that poor guy he is a, he was not a criminal just because he was white nobody knows about him george floyd household name even Indian newspapers. So that's my answer, you know. So we had to be, wait, let me tell you something. We had to be answerable to Jesus Christ for all these, uh, all these things when we do, because he doesn't go by color. You know, just like <laughs> Martin Luther King said, by the conduct of the character. Thank you for the yes. question. Mm. I had a question that came to me, uh, and I'll ask this of both of you. It um, comes from, Romans 16, 1 uh, concerning Phoebe. And the question is, why can't women be deaconesses? Um, and if we look at 16, 1, uh, you know, there's there's arguments that are made, obviously, from from Phoebe and the word that's used there to describe her. So uh, why is it that only 
uh, men can be deacons and, and women cannot be deaconesses. Dr. Alexander, I thought we handled that in the complementarianism <laughs> and egalitarianism, you know, <laughs> so if you want to, you know, just uh, brush up on that one. By the way, while he's looking, you know, Raymond, you know, I forgot when you asked the uh, race fluidity, it is there, you know, two white women, you know, yeah. pretended and lived many decades as uh, blacks, you know, and the black leadership and the famous person is uh, Elizabeth, Senator Elizabeth Warren, you know, as an Indian, you know, as a, then Trump made him to make a DNA trust, you know, so, you know, the rest of the story, you know, so gender fluid, uh, just like that race fluid also, some people also trying to do that, you know, so just that when you ask immediately, you know, because my blame my brain operation, it usually I used to know immediately after two minutes, I thought about that, you know, so race fluid. So Dr. Alexander. Okay. Yeah, there is a, you know, there is a, a, a lot of dispute and various opinions about uh, first uh, Roman 16, one about Phoebe, Phoebe and her role. Uh, she is called a servant of the church in Kangrea. So it is from the word, uh, you know, deacon, we get the word uh, uh, servant. So, as all of us know, some people think that she was an official deaconess in that church. Many others would think that uh, she was serving in a general way according to the need and she was very committed you know that is why her name is particularly mentioned so then the question comes was it just a general serving and helping in a commendable way or was did she have an official position as a deaconess my own thinking is that in the early church and in the uh, early Christian history, there were rigid separation of the sexes in that culture. You know, for example, like when a sister was uh, getting baptized, a woman was getting baptized, uh, the women had, even today, that is true, but it is more than that in those days. So uh, when a sister was in the hospital and some of them for their faith were imprisoned, in order to minister to sisters more effectively, probably there would have been, you know, deaconesses uh, in the church. I'm not sure. Yeah, but because of the situation there, some women might have been recognized in a special way to minister in that capacity. But no further uh, instruction is given in relation to that. So, uh, we cannot blow that into a doctrinal system. And I believe whether it is officially or unofficially in most uh, uh, assemblies I know of, there are sisters who are willing and voluntary and helpful to other sisters in their specific needs. And we recognize them. Does all sisters do that? I don't think so. There are some sisters who are committed to that. The, those who are more mature, knowledgeable, those who have a burden, they do that as a mission, their life's ministry. And uh, so, and such people, such sisters, we recognize and we esteem them, um, whether it is in an official way or in an unofficial way. So, in teaching in relation to that, so we don't have to worry about uh, that too much today but we should definitely recognize those who sisters who are called and gifted and who have a special calling and ministry. And in the churches, they should have that recognition. Even today, you know, many uh, sisters are working hard you know, in the chapels, you know, so yeah. they, they have no titles, you know, in the or, or New Testament also, we see that uh, uh, many sisters uh, were, you know, in the forefront, you know, even counseling, uh, Apollos, you know, so I was Aquila and uh, uh, Prisca, you know, so, yeah. yeah, so many sisters were in the forefront, you know, although they didn't have any titles, you know, so there is no official deaconess's title in the New Testament assembly, just because of yeah. the, some uh, some events, you know, some incidents, you know, versus we can establish a doctrine 
uh, of deaconesses in the assemblies. Yes, that is why, you know, in Romans 16, even though this passage is there, no further teaching and no further elaboration of that is given, you know, uh, in the rest of the New Testament. And uh, probably the only other passage would be 1 Timothy chapter 3, where there is a mention of women in between. So again, who are these those women? And uh, many would say they are the wives of deacon, deacons. So then why the, the, the wives of elders are not mentioned? And why so special about uh, the wives of deacons? So those women, were they specially recognized in ministering, whether without a title or not? whether they were especially recognized to group in the assembly to minister to uh, sisters, especially in the midst of uh, a very strict distinction of uh, genders and uh, their involvement. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. Appreciate that. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, I have one if you don't mind. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so this was uh, piggybacking off a couple of questions before when they're talking about the sin unto death and not unto death. So I, I believe uh, that destroys the whole argument that many pastors today will preach the doctrine that all sin is equal, which I don't believe. But do uh, you think all sin is equal? I guess it's a no based on what you were saying. Uh, let me ask you one question. If if somebody go and uh, pinch pinch somebody, you know, without their permission, then another person take a knife and stab and kill. You know, it's both both <laughs> sin. You know, violations. Is both uh, you consider both the same or uh, absolutely not? <laughs> yeah. yeah, in the Bible, any any all are sin. You know, but is there any differentiation in the Bible? Yeah, of course. You know, there are all the it's a categorized as sin. Everything is. Just like a list of the, you know, which we can choose, you know, sins, you know, that we have many places, you know, list uh, covetousness and gossip and uh, lying and a lot of sins are mentioned in the Bible, you know. So when you say, you know, so homosexuality, just like we said before, you know, God sees some sins, you know, in a more serious way, just like, you know, the, our laws are based upon biblical precepts, you know, mm -hmm. that's why, yeah. you know, when the cold blood or murder happens, we, we sentence some the court sentence to death when somebody mm -hmm. slap you know assault you know will be two years in jail even uh, uh, Derek Shevin, you know 22 years you know because you know not uh, sentenced to death you know so there are differences in the bible in the secular also i hope uh, dr alexander can go with me too. yes i think in the example which you used it's uh, very evident that there are all sins are sins falling short of the standard of God, you know, and all sins uh, are condemned by the law. Uh, but certain sins have uh, more seriousness and gravity in relations to its consequence, impact and extent and how it affects other people and society. So there are special laws and uh, uh, legislation and rules to curtail uh, such uh, sins because of the damage it does uh, to the society at large and to families and to other individuals. So in impact, extent and consequences, uh, some uh, sins are more serious than others. Yeah, I would just add to that uh, one thing, and that is the, the sins as mentioned already, uh, are varying uh, degrees, uh, I guess, of punishment or maybe judgment if we're looking at the great white throne judgment. We understand that the more serious sin is going to deserve a more serious judgment mm -hmm. and the righteous judgment of the Lord as executed at the great white throne judgment is going to be, that judgment is going to be more severe. Uh, whereas, uh, a lesser sin, although still a separation from the Lord 
and leading unto death, as Dr. Alexander just mentioned, uh, the judgment is not going to be as severe. Uh, we do see that in Scripture, and conversely, it is true for the believer at the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ. Uh, the works, as in both scenarios, in both judgments, whether in uh, the lake of fire in eternity or um, the rewards that are given, they are based on works. But salvation, or whether you are with the Lord or not with the Lord, that is not based on works. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's an important distinction, that uh, even for the believer, the works are important, and the works do determine the rewards given. As, uh, as mentioned by our Lord, as mentioned by Paul over and over in the New Testament, and then in Revelation, we do see uh, that works for the sinner or for uh, the non-believer is going to lead to a more strict or uh, worse punishment. So although uh, sins do have varying degree, any sin uh, without uh, accepting Christ is going to cause that death or separation, but the penalty for each sin is different. Uh, so yes. I just wanted to add that aspect to it. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. And it, it is the sin of unbelief, you know? Yes. Not believing in Jesus Christ as one's personal savior. That is the sin that will finally condemn a person to eternal hell. Not because he was an adulterer or thief or homosexual or anything, you know? But the sin that would condemn a sinner to eternal hell is that that person did not receive the Lord Jesus as his, his or her personal savior. That is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. And thank you for that question. Are there any other questions? Well, with the long silence, I guess there are no more questions. Um, so just in conclusion, again, want to thank you all for uh, joining us uh, on this journey of over a year. Uh, Dr. Alexander Goodian, Dr. John Matthew, uh, certainly I greatly appreciate both of you. Uh, many of you may or may not know this, but uh, both of these brothers uh, have been a great mentor to me, and I have spent much time with both of them and greatly appreciate both of them uh, for their uh, spiritual leadership uh, in my life, especially. Uh, so certainly want to thank them for that, as well as their, their time and effort uh, for this past uh, over a year now. So we'll go ahead and have uh, a short time of prayer, and I thought maybe we could uh, take a few minutes for for a few that would like to pray, uh, and then uh, perhaps um, Alexander, if maybe after uh, a few uh, few brothers pray, if you wouldn't mind closing our session mm -hmm. with a word of prayer, if that would be okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we'll open up for a few to pray, and, and you can unmute and uh, and pray. Dear Father, we just <clears throat> thank you for this time that we had to study your word, Lord. We just thank you for the wisdom that's in your word, and thank you for Dr. Alexander Curian and Dr. John Matthew for their wisdom and for their studying the scriptures, and just pray that you would bless this to our lives, that we would be uh, more effective witnesses for you, and thank you for Raymond also for his uh, leading this uh, study. Lord, we just thank you for your love and care toward us. We pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you again for this time. Lord, uh, what a great uh, blessing it is to be around by word. Mm -hmm. And again, Dear Lord, to know what is happening in our own generation to be aware of, and also in the light of the scripture as believers, our responsibility. 
Thank you for this, dear ones, dear Lord, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander Kurian, as well as uh, Dr. John Matthew, uh, along with uh, Raymond. It, it, these days of difficulties and uh, problems that would saw that uh, we found an opportunity to come around and study the word. Thank you for all those who joined and been benefited. Thank you for this dear ones took time to study this uh, uh, matters and questions uh, deeply and to explain it to others and for each one of us. Father, we pray that thou may reward them for what they have done for thy glory. And if so, Lord, in the days to come, we'll be aware that uh, we are living in a dangerous and evil time that uh, we may redeem the time well, looking into the scripture and also looking towards thy coming back. Thank you again, dear Lord, for this time. Ask it in the precious name, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time uh, that you gave us to uh, Lord ponder upon these various topics. Um, Father, we thank you because you have given us your infallible uh, word, oh Lord. We thank you um, because you are an unchanging God and so are your words. Though the world may change and all the ideologies and thoughts uh, that the uh, the evil one may bring uh, the deceptive thoughts uh, mm. that may uh, uh, that is that is brought into the mankind, Lord, um, because of which men change, but your word never change. And we thank you for giving us uh, a light in this dark world, O oh Lord. Thanking you for uh, Dr. Alexander Kurian and Dr. John Matthew, and also with Brother. Uh, Raymond Johnson to uh, bring these uh, various uh, topics that issues that uh, that is that the the current age is facing and that they were able to uh, uh, present these uh, topics in the light of the word and we thank you for these uh, uh, Lord uh, these materials um, praying that we 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 were benefited from this and uh, we thank you for uh, this time uh, we also pray that uh, those who are who will uh, who are listening all around the world and also who will be in future listening to those recorded sessions may benefit from that and uh, lord that they may um, uh, they may turn back from um, the, those uh, their ways and turn to the lord that it may be a light uh, for many and that um, that uh, that this may become a blessing to uh, to many a lord uh, to know the truth and uh, to walk in truth um, we thank you father once again for um, for, for arrange the, arranging this opportunity for all of us in jesus name we pray amen amen uh, Loving God, our gracious Father, we thank you and praise you for allowing us to gather together around your holy word for the last more than a year in your sovereign will, providential care, plan, and purpose. Uh, thou has allowed us to do it, and we praise you and thank you for it. We praise you, Father, that uh, in spite of the pandemic and other difficult situations and thou has proved uh, time and again that thy word is not hindered. It is the word of God and it will have a free course and thou will orchestrate the ways through which uh, it will be propagated and it will be proclaimed and taught. And in our own lives and in our ministries and even in this forum, we were able to enjoy that and understand it and appreciate it and we thank you for it. Thank you for all those who participated and uh, those who were able to teach and share. Thank you for all the questions and discussions and the time of fellowship and prayer and all the encouragement uh, this has brought to our hearts. And as these sessions are recorded and as uh, many may go back to uh, uh, look into it and uh, many new people may visit these uh, recorded videos and messages that it may edify them, bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and clarify many doctrinal, practical and contemporary and cultural issues in the light of the word 
in their hearts and minds. We pray that thou may glorify thyself even through this uh, humble ministry and uh, in your own time, plan and purpose that we may be able to gather together again to study your word. Until that time, keep us humble, faithful and pure in the things of the Lord and in the ministries that are committed to us. We thank you for the blessed hope before us that looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we look forward to that day when we all will be together yes. in your holy presence and mm -hmm. all our questions will be answered and we will know everything perfectly and completely and we will be uh, transformed uh, unto your glorious image. What a glorious destiny yes. from the foundation of the world until the that day our eternal destiny is sealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise you for that great and wonderful truth. May we enjoy it and may we learn it, may we teach it, and may we be bold witnesses to those tremendous gospel truths. We praise you and thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, well, again, we thank you all for joining us. And uh, we hope that you have a wonderful evening. And we certainly look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, at some point, we'll send another notification out. Thank you very much. God bless Thanks. everyone. Thanks, Thanks we'll for this. With, and uh, God willing, we will come back and have more forums at the right time. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.